Welcome to DTNS Experiment Week. All this week, DTNS is on summer vacation, but in its place is Experiment Week, where our producers and contributors are trying out new show ideas and releasing them right here on the DTNS feed. Enjoy. Welcome to Tech TV Scrapbook the podcast that talks to the people and personalities who made the Tech TV Network such an innovative and forward-thinking channel. My name is Roger Chang, and I'm the host of the show, and I was also a former producer at Tech TV. When Tech TV launched back in August of 1998 as ZDTV, it was positioned as a 24-hour cable network devoted to computers, technology, and the Internet. As part of that mission, two help and how-to shows were created, The Screensavers and Call for Help. The screensavers focused on a more tech literate audience that saw technology as both a tool and a hobby. Call for help focused on users who were either computer neophytes and needed more help, or they were people who used technology purely for business and work. Eventually, Tech TV became G4 TV, and during that transition, the screensavers was transitioned into the show known as Attack of the Show, whereas Call for Help went off the air or so it is commonly thought. In fact, Call for Help migrated north, like geese, uh, to Canada, where it was part of the G4 Tech TV Canada network. Um, I have with me, with great pleasure, Jen Cutter, because you happen to work at Call for Help Canada. Now, I guess the first question I should ask you is, how did you start? How did you get in the door uh, into uh, Tech TV Canada? And more importantly, how did you get on Call for Help? Uh, They are one in the same story. And it's kind of this, it's a huge snowball. It's kind of ridiculous. So Amber Mack, the main host of Call for Help with Leo, uh, she had her own like side YouTube show called Command End. And she had posted that on the internet. I had made my own videos at openalpha.tv for YouTube kind of thing, just talking about the gaming stuff that I love to talk about. And I'd been doing my work in Windows Movie Maker. And then I saw Command End and I was like, oh, like this show's shot in Toronto. I know where they're shooting. So I looked up their editor, Brian, and I emailed him because I was too scared to email Amber. <laughs> and I well, said, well, hey. Before we get too far, who is Amber Mack? Well, Amber Mack is the host of Call for Help Canada with Leo Laporte. And uh, gosh, she's been doing everything forever. I've seen her on every news network in Canada. And right now she's doing tons of podcasts and corporate events. And you see her every once in a while on DTNS. She's a tech legend up here. And she's the one that got you in the door or did you just contact you? You contacted the producer. who? So, yeah, I exactly. I contacted uh, her editor, Brian, to say like, hey, you guys are doing all this cool stuff. I'm in Toronto, too. I'd love to learn more. And he's like, well, just come to a shoot. So I went to a shoot. He invited me down. I got to meet Amber Mack. I got to meet Mike Lazazara, a producer at Call for Help, who was doing Command End with her at the time. Uh, And then they gave me all sorts of tips and stuff. And they said, hey, there's a meetup going on the next day. You should come out to that, too. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I went to this meetup and this was a really good meetup to be at because Leal was there, Kevin Rose was there, Alex Albrecht was there. They were so kind. They introduced me to everybody. Uh, and so I got to talk to Leo and Leo's like, oh, like, well, what do you do? And I said, oh, I do this show on YouTube. And he's like, oh, I'll check it out. And I'm like, aha, uh-huh, sure. All right. Bye. <laughs> uh, by the time I got home after that amazing party, I had a voicemail from Leo saying, hey, I liked your shows. You should come down to the studio tomorrow while we're recording. And I was like, uh, okay. Uh, I called in sick to work. I went to the studio. I got introduced to everybody. Uh, everyone's taping segments. To me, it's chaos because so many things are happening all at once. And at the end of the last taping of the day, Leo says, stay tuned next, uh, stay tuned next month. I've got a new girl. You're going to love her. And I'm just like literally sitting on the floor beside Alex Albrecht going like, oh, that's neat. I wonder who he's talking about. And Alex is like thumping me on the back and Kevin Rose is cheering. And I'm like, wait, what just happened? And I'm thinking like, oh, God, someone's going to tell me what happens next, right? Because everything's just been a blur for the last three days. I guess the follow up question I have for you at that point is, have you heard of Tech TV? Did you know what Call for Help was before uh, before that point? I mean, did you? 
was it available on on cable in your area up in Canada, or was it like completely new and then you just had to kind of uh, uh, school yourself on all that before before you came in? I had heard of Tech TV uh, mostly because I'd heard of X Play because we did have X Play air up here on other networks at the time. Uh, but then when all this stuff started happening, like I, I had Googled who Amber Mack was before emailing the editor. And then I had Googled who Leo was before showing up at the meetup. And then, yeah, like that night after uh, Leo was like, okay, and like, well, we're going to get you on the show next month. I just did this huge deep dive. And the biggest thing for me was I had to find somebody I knew <laughs> who actually had G4 Tech TV Canada because it was a specialty channel. Like you weren't just like getting it with your cable. So amazingly, my parents were the ones who had the cable package. So I was like, hey, I'm going to come over and like fill your DVR and watch 8 billion shows <laughs> before next month. So that's how I schooled myself and like looking up clips on the Internet. Now, what did you think of that network at the time? I, I mean, from from my point of view as a producer, um, you know, tech TV was was literally positioned uh, as a specialty technology uh, computer information network, a spinoff from from the original Ziff Davis brand. Did it have a different kind of uh, look and feel in Canada, or is it pretty much the same? The studio for Call for Help is smaller than half of my basement. It was the tiny, I don't know how they managed to fit three desks and three cameras and all of those lights and all of it. It was in the Omni building, which isn't going to mean anything to anyone outside of Toronto, but Omni is this multicultural network in Toronto and Southern Ontario. And it's like they had to move other shows stuff out for us to use the studio for the one week a month that we did. So I was really shocked that this set that actually looked really good on TV was so tiny, <laughs> it was so, so small. And you didn't have any prior television or broadcast studio experience before that point? I had exactly 22 minutes of on-camera time on my previous two Open Alpha episodes before I <laughs> set foot in a TV studio. And that was so all I, just self-recorded and published? That and was me shooting in my apartment <laughs> was what that was. And my best friend uh, came and helped me out with the camera when I wanted to move things around. Now, when you started, did they give you an assigned role as a producer or were you there for just a, a limited uh, limited capacity? For example, uh, um, when I started, I was an intern. And so what I did was all the intern stuff. I brought products over to the studio and I brought them back. I wasn't really hired until uh, there was an opening and I just happened to be graduating from SF State. So this, you know, the, the, the show producer brought me aside. So, Roger, walk with me. And I started walking. It's like, are you graduate? It's like, did you graduate yet? It's like, no, I graduate in like four weeks. It's like, okay, would you like a job? It's like, yes, I would, I would like a job. Well, we need a PA. You're really smart. You're really good with, with all the computers and stuff. Can you handle that? It's like, yes. And that's where my job came from. Was yours kind of similar or were they like, you're going to be doing gaming, you know, do gaming stuff or was there a, uh, um, uh, a more in-depth kind of a, uh, or, or not in-depth, but a more calculated plan for you uh, into the into the show. Uh, it was it was pretty defined. Like it took me a while to figure it out what it was, but basically, especially for like, I don't know, my first like twelve episodes, I reported directly to Leo. All of my pitches went to him, uh, and then like if I needed help sourcing something. Uh, I usually did that on my own, but on occasion I had to ask Amber for help. I was like, Amber, my thing died. Could you have a replacement, one of these at the studio that I could use? And she always helped me out. But basically I got to pitch absolutely anything I wanted. It did not have to be gaming related. It just had to be tech related. And uh, yeah, so I would send him like four or five pitches. He'd pick three or four of them. And then I'd uh, be told what days to show up at the studio and with how many different outfits of clothing. Oh, interesting. So you you were in effect a, an on air uh, a contributor for the for the show. Um, no, I mean that's that's fantastic. I think it's a it's a, a testament to your skill and your your, your knowledge that they felt so comfortable that you know you would easily slot in 
Uh, oh, I'm with, sure somebody with, thought Leo was crazy for bringing on this literally random girl who, like, now I've done tons of print work at this point. Like, I've written for gaming magazines since I was a teenager. And at this point, I'm, you know, in my early 20s, uh, I've done several E3s and all that stuff. But TV, like, nobody ever looked at me and said, you know what, that girl needs to be on camera. I mean, it's... <sighs> It's such an unusual experience, and I, I'll interject my life story in here just as a just as a p comparison and contrast. You know, I come from a broadcasting background along with Sarah Lane. We actually graduated together from the same school. In fact, much of the studio crew and and a lot of the producers at ZDTV when it was originally ZDTV also came from the same school. And so it was a very weird experience to go from a classroom. It's like, hey, my job also has the same people in it. Um, and, you know, as a PA, a production assistant, when I when I started working, my role specifically was to ensure that the set machines were working, that all the stuff needed for that day shoot was there, whether it was a, a gadget, a product, um, or, you know, basically uh, bookmarking the URLs, web pages, making sure they were all loaded, preloaded, pre-cached. So they, you know, when Leo or, or one of the other hosts uh, clicked on a link, uh, and I will make a side note here. I actually had to do both screensavers and call for help. So I was involved with both shows uh, from the very beginning. Um, you know, I had to make sure all that was set. It was also my job to make sure that the set stayed, you know, workable. That means all the set computers, the lighting, if there's any issues, I would, you know, if it was lighting. I would let the studio crew know it's like, hey, I need a new bulb uh, for this, uh, for this set. Um, but that was my, my job. And, I also doubled as a, a gopher. So if someone needed something, I would either drive out and get it, or I would run out on foot and grab grab it at the local safe, Safeways. Um, so I mean, it's a very it's a it's a very interesting uh, dichotomy between your experience and mine. Um, I had I worked with uh, two producers on screensavers and two producers on call for help. And I also worked with Leo, who was managing editor at the time. So all the questions, anything to do with any of the content on the shows passed through Leo because he had the final say on whether it made it in, on air. Um, with screensavers, uh, some of that workload was split between him and uh, Kate Patello, who's uh, the original co-host uh, for the screensavers. Uh, but for Call for Help, Leo was solo. And so he, you know, run it by him. And this is this is very interesting. We would give him the questions that we wanted to use for the week the Friday before, and he would go over on the week weekends. He would just go over them, and <laughs> on his commutes, he would use a little uh, uh, he would use a little dictaphone, and he would just record his answers. And that was one of my jobs was to trans uh, uh, not transmute uh, um, uh, uh, transcribe <laughs> all those tapes into like actual, you know, in, into actual uh, script content for the show. I would work with the producers, said, this is what Leo says. This is probably what we need. My job was to double check what his answers were. And if they were slightly different or there was another better answer, I was supposed to uh, slot that in. Yeah, I'm like looking back, it's kind of ridiculous the amount of trust I was given because obviously television uses teleprompters and i was allowed to write for leo basically like here are the questions that you need to prompt for this next segment and they let me write that stuff which was really cool i know you keep in contact with amber mac yes and are there any other people you kind of regularly keep in touch with from your uh, from your days back then i should do a better job of reaching out but one person i do keep in contact with and actually ended up working with after call for help is steve sailor uh, he, uh, you may know him by his old gaming nickname, Snowball. He's a Twitch streamer. He works on uh, accessibility and gaming. Uh, he used to run the teleprompter for Call for Help for a season or so. And then he ended up producing a uh, show that I did with Darren Kitchen of Hack5 called The War Room. And we did this old school World of Warcraft radio show. <laughs> um, but also I want to shout out Sean Carruthers, who I feel like basically was the main producer. Anything else I had to do on the show, I ran through him. Uh, Sean Carruthers, amazing, amazing guy, same skill set as you. He made sure everything works. If I ever had a problem with anything, he took care of it. Uh, Mike Lazazara, another fantastic producer. 
Uh, Leo was amazing. The camera crew was so sweet. Uh, I, I feel like I will give a special shout out to Bear. Uh, let's see. Oh God, there were so many people. I, was, I wish was Bear I took a more camera bear. person. Bear was a camera person. Okay. Yes. Bear I'm just was, making sure it wasn't man. like a literal bear that they kept around that. <laughs> oh no, I mean, we didn't have yeah. the room for it. But uh, but everyone was really sweet and teaching me the basics. Like, yeah, so we're gonna shoot this, but we need you to stand on this box. And I'm like, why? <laughs> it's like, cause you're short and you need to be taller next to Leo. And then there was a whole discussion like the first day. It's like you need to go put on a different sweater because we can see your belly button and i'm like well you couldn't a minute ago just let me not stand on the box and it's like yeah well we can't do that go go put on a sweater it's like oh fine um what else what else oh it's so cool the studio was on the lakeshore too so it was always such a lovely drive getting up there uh and so yeah so after that first year uh in order to lighten Leo's load a bit, I was handed off to another uh, segment producer called Mohit. And Mohit was a guy I pitched all the rest of my stuff to for the last bit of the year. And I think that's all of the main people that I dealt with on a daily basis. Because our shooting schedule was very different from yours. Because you guys, what did you guys do? Did you guys shoot like every day? Every day. day. Every, every day. day. I, I understand. And the only reason why I know this is because I talked to Leo about this because he was asking me questions initially um because it involved because of CanCon or canadian content rules leo can never be the host of the show so he was just a perennial guest um <laughs> and so but they had the gang shoot all the episodes so he would be up there for like a when i say up there he would be up in canada like fly up from the san francisco bay area to mm -hmm. toronto i think yes. uh and and shoot like a within a week or two weeks uh, of like all the stuff they would need for the following month or so if i, I if i understand that correctly yeah um i picked him up in the airport once or twice he would fly into yyz in toronto so wait um, you were also like the chauffeur <laughs> well i lived like literally next to the airport so technically i had volunteered i was like okay if you ever need a ride from the airport i'm like wait, literally you down next the, to the street airport? i hope you got a discount on your uh, rent <laughs> No, like you honestly, you, you you don't hear the planes after a while. It's it's when the planes stop that you notice something's wrong. It's too quiet. It's too quiet. Um, yeah, so there was always one week a month where Leo would fly up and we would shoot three to four episodes a day, which is why I was told to bring multiple sets of clothes so that if I shot like first show in the morning and the first show after lunch, I could, you know, change my shirt and pants and stuff. Were you, did you actively go out? It's like, all right, I got to buy TV friendly clothes and then just have like part of your wardrobe TV yeah. only. Well, uh, to start, Leo was very adamant that I only wear stuff I like wore at home. And I was not the don't try to be pretty was the unspoken <laughs> thing. Uh, I was just like, yeah, no, like wear your hoodies, wear your hockey jerseys, like just be you. And I was like, okay, awesome. And then we did like one press event in the States and he's like, Maybe bring a girl shirt. I'm like, okay, I can do that too. <laughs> I mean, no, that's great. At least on screensavers, there was definitely a, a desire to make it feel very casual, to make it feel like, you know, the, the set was designed to look like someone's basement. This is where you hang out. This is where you work in your, your technology. And I know with Call for Help, they were trying to make it feel more like a home office. So a lot of the colors, a lot of the, if you look at Leo's wardrobe, tended to be more business casual. Right. So you had soft, warmer. It was very uh, it was a very, very, you know, conscious effort. And I'm glad to hear that, like when they did it, moved it to Canada, uh, they weren't so hung up on you looking or dressing in a very specific way. Yeah, I, I had so much freedom. It's like I'm looking back and at the jobs I've had since it's like, wow, I really I really got lucky with my first camera experience. Was there one or or maybe a handful of episodes that stand out in your mind the most? Like when you think of your time there, it's the, the thing that pops in your head immediately. Um, let's see. Oh, well, like the, the Step Mania episode where I was showing people you could play DDR on your PC or laptop. That show was fun and chaotic because... Uh, yeah, like I had everything tech that could have gone wrong went wrong. And I had Amber and Sean Carruthers helping me out with like 
parts to put this together and I, I like nearly had to solder part of my pad because it did not like being shoved in my car and then dragged around the studio for a while to get that working so it was a lot of like fly by the seat of your pants stuff but um I really loved watching everybody else work. I learned so much from seeing how calm they were. And Call for Help, I don't know if this was the same for you guys down there, but we were live to tape. Oh, yeah, always. Well, the thing is, um, we were live. Live, so, live. Live, live. We, had a, we didn't even have a 10-second delay when we first started out, so we were always <laughs> paranoid. We would get the one live caller who would like be really nice when we... Uh, call screen and that was one of my jobs as an intern was a call screener um and we were just i mean especially leo because he he, he did a radio show for the longest time even before uh even before doing uh tech tv and the site um before it uh he was just like you know we needed we need a 10 second delay because one of these days we're going to get a call that's really nice and then they're just gonna start <laughs> yelling profanities you know out of left field and it's just going to be like a total a total you know wtf uh thankfully never had that but yeah we were always live yeah for us i remember being warned like as i'm about to step into the studio producer grabs my shoulders like okay so listen the callers can hear everything that happens in the studio because they're just on hold all day <laughs> so like don't say anything you wouldn't want a caller to hear i'm like i'm not going to say anything anyway so we're good <laughs> i'm just going to sit here and watch what do you think you got most out of the the experience was there a skill set? Uh, were there people that you networked? Was it a combination of both? Was there anything that you feel that I have become a different but a better person because of this experience? One of the most surprising benefits of the show to me was all of a sudden my job was now legitimate. Even though I'd been writing for print magazines and writing for websites and making legitimate money as a gaming journalist <laughs> since I was a teenager, the second I showed up on TV, suddenly I now I had a real job. <laughs> so my family stopped telling people that I worked in IT. Oh, actually, I guess that's a side question. <laughs> a side, see, now it makes me think of a, sec, a secondary question of that. Because my mom, when she found like, oh, your show's on, and I was regularly on air she would be really excited because you know at the, at the restaurant uh it was the middle of the day when they were closed because they were open for lunch they closed for three hours and they opened for dinner mm -hmm. uh and during that three hours she would clean uh and then just sit down and watch tv and i would be on and she'd be very excited and she would always tell me it's like oh you have to be very careful about you know how you speak because people you know or think highly of you now and all that did your family have a very similar kind of a uh, uh, view of, of your of your time in front of the camera? Well, I, I think like that just kind of set it for them that I wasn't wasting my life. Like this was a real job with real outcomes that other people see. <laughs> it wasn't uh, it wasn't me like because I, I didn't go to university. I, I started working straight out of high school. And um, yeah, it was just really nice to have that sense of legitimacy. And it definitely made pitching things in the future to other places easier. And then other news networks started calling me. So like CB24 was like, hey, there's a Nintendo event. Can you do a hit for us? And to be like, yes, I will send me a cameraman. I'll show up and do that hit. So I got to do stuff like that. So I showed up on CBC once and CB24. And then, yeah, I think it was after that because I had done e3 for many many years and then uh, at the launch of the nintendo ds tv tokyo came up to me and they're like hey can you you speak english do you want to do a thing with us and i'd be like okay sure so i showed up on tv tokyo for a couple of segments that was really fun and once you could say that oh you've been on tv uh it made a huge difference and it really it, i'd say it widened my fan base not so much in Canada, because very few people in Canada seem to have the network, but because we had a lot of international deals, all of a sudden I started getting all of this mail from Australia and some from the UK and a lot from the United States. So, I, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's the final question I had in my head as you're, you're, you're explaining your, your experience. Do you, do you find that you suddenly became more recognizable where you were just in the store or you were just... You know, some were very, you thought was very innocuous. And some was like, hey, you're Jen Cutter. You're from Call for <laughs> Help Canada. Uh, yeah, I definitely got recognized at conferences a lot more. Um, you know, there's good and bad that comes with that. I had some person following me around 
PAX East. And then I, my, my friend sent me a link saying like, hey, do you know this guy? Because he's posted 300 pictures of you on his Flickr account. And I'm like, oh, oh, that's not great. I'll, I'll have to look at that when I'm home. Um, but yeah, like in computer stores in Toronto, occasionally like grocery shopping. And then like at least once a year for five years, somebody would see me and go like, oh, oh, Amber. And I'm like, oh, so close. Like I knew that like they could recognize me from the show. And then they reached for the first female show, female name that they associated with that show. And so they'd call me Amber for people who are do not know what I look like. I do not look like Amber Mack. Amber Mack is a gorgeous person and I am a very nerdy hockey player. But I'm thinking like you can't if you put me and Amber next to each other, you're not going to confuse us as related. <laughs> They were always very apologetic about it. Like, oh, no, yeah, Jen, Jen, can you say hi to Amber for me? It's like, yes, I will say hi to Amber for you. Don't worry about it. I guess I guess to close, um, if you had to do it all over again, would you have done anything differently knowing what you do know now? Or do you think, like, overall the experience was beneficial for the way it played out and the way you, you know, you experienced things? Oh, for what I know now, uh, I would absolutely have asked way more questions. I would have asked for like more responsibility. I would have tried to pitch some different form segments. I'd love to have like done a segment with Sean or with Mike just to get like more faces in front of the camera. Um, but like I, I had an absolutely wonderful time. I'm so glad that it happened. I'm just really grateful for the whole experience. That's, I mean... I, I am with you. I, I often I often say to anyone who cares to listen, which is not many because my wife has stopped listening as well, uh, <laughs> that you know my time at Tech TV, ZDTV, uh, was like a going to a second university, like industry facing uh, kind of education. But I you know I made a lot of great friends. I made a lot of intelligent, smart people who I am grateful that I still know today. And one of those people, believe it or not, is you. It's great. Aww. Like, I would have never met you otherwise. Uh, yeah, and uh, it was so great. Like, one of the huge benefits of going to E3, aside of from going to E3, was because I had a G4 Tech TV Canada press pass, they would let me into, like, the G4 staging area where they had all of the stuff for X-Play and Attack of the Show. So I'd get to go meet all the people there and hang out and meet so many friends there. I was <laughs> I was Olivia Munn's stand-in for a couple of segments when her stand-in was not feeling well, and I was like, "I can stand there and do that, sure." Unfortunately, we're we're at our time limit. Uh, but before we go, is there anywhere you would like people to follow your comings and goings, social media platform, blog, anything you'd like to to shout out? Uh, well, I am at Jen Cutter, Jen with two N's, at literally every current social media platform on the planet, of which there are many. <laughs> we'll find out who wins in a year from now, I guess. Uh, and then there's JenCutter.com and OpenAlpha.tv. All right, that's it for this episode of Tech TV Scrapbook. And if you'd like to hear more stories from behind the scenes of ZDTV Tech TV from the people who work there, email me at feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If there's enough interest, I will continue the series with other producers, on-air talent, and crew that made ZDTV Tech TV possible. Hey folks, Tom Merritt here again. That's it for Experiment Week. Thanks to all the contributors who made these great shows. We hope you enjoyed it. Let us know what you think. Email us, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're back to regular shows on Monday. See you then.